So hello and welcome to episode three in our third season of Rock to the Cloud and for what is now my second time of hosting the show. Let me start by once again uh, to offer you a massive thanks uh, or offer a massive thanks to you all for staying with us on the series as we see it every week. We really do love spending this time with you to discuss all topics around Windows Server 2022 and actually, as you've seen, more around our Microsoft hybrid solutions or hybrid cloud solutions uh, as we're seeking to evolve this. So in each episode of From Rock to the Cloud, we're bringing some of the world's most foremost figures in Windows Server and indeed hybrid to help you get whatever you need or that you just want to know about it. So per the usual, if you have any questions about the episode, make sure you pop them into the comments below. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So please put your comments in the section just down there. So in today's episode, um, uh, we're going to, well, it's called Manage from the Cloud with Azure Arc. And if you remember from last week's show, if you tuned in, we had Pierre Romain. Uh, this week, for the next 30 minutes, we're going to be catching up with none other than Thomas Mora. Um, we'll also have some elements later that you guys can get involved with. So again, do stick around um, for the fun part of the show. Um, but this is obviously going to be the really interesting part of the show. Um, where we uh, will be bringing Thomas. So Thomas, can you tell me what is your role at Microsoft? Uh, welcome very much and <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, uh, hi, Jason. Yeah, my name is Thomas Maurer. I'm a senior program manager and chief evangelist for Azure Hybrid. Uh, I recently joined that team in the engineering and I work like on end-to-end -end solutions when it comes to Azure Hybrid, speaking namely of like Azure Stack, Azure Stack HCI, as well as um, uh, Azure Arc solutions. Excellent. And I do believe you've been on the show before, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. I have the great honor to, uh, I think I last, already be part of it in the last two seasons um, and talking about several things around Windows Server and especially Azure Hybrid. Yeah, absolutely. And it's great to be back. That's, I'm glad to hear, but obviously with a new house now, but clearly nowhere near as good as our predecessor, Thomas. And, and I'm sure he'll be watching once again, just to validate that. So look, on the previous show, as I mentioned, we had Pierre Roman, and we did discuss Azure Arc and why companies should care about Microsoft when it comes to hybrid and multi-cloud. Um, could you just please recap for us, you know, your thoughts and provide your insight, if that's okay? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, there's, so hybrid is obviously a very uh, important uh, part. Like when it comes to hybrid, I think we have numbers that like 90% of customers uh, actually have a hybrid strategy and rely on a hybrid cloud solution. Um, so uh, think about like uh, factories, retail stores, edge locations, or just companies who want to run certain stuff uh, in data sovereign solutions in their own data center, or they need to have like, uh, the, like they have latency or network constraints as well. And so uh, for us in Microsoft, hybrid is obviously very important. Uh, and I always ch uh, quote Jason Zanders, which is the, or was the uh, lead of all the engineering uh, teams in Azure. And he was basically saying hybrid is going to be an end state for many of our customers and not just an in-between state. And why I'm mm -hmm. actually quoting this is really because that shows how important hybrid for us is, right? And hybrid at Microsoft, it's not just a single product. It's really a set of solutions, products, and services which enable our customers depending on what their needs are. Uh, from our uh, Azure Stack portfolio with different solutions such as Azure Stack Hub, Edge, and especially Azure Stack HCI, uh, when it comes to like bring those cloud-inspired components into the customer's data center and edge locations. But then if you think about IoT uh, and other solutions uh, as well. But I think most importantly in the last couple of years, uh, especially Azure Arc, right? Which really helps in, in many different uh, cases um, with our customers. And we usually do um, split Azure Arc in like two different categories, if you will. Uh, the first category being uh, having a single control plane and con uh, what we call uh, Azure Arc enabled infrastructure, which means yeah, we yeah. allow you to connect servers and Kubernetes clusters to that control plane and manage them. And then the second piece, which we we'll probably talk a little bit later today as well, depending on if you have time, I guess, um, is bringing we'll make Azure time. <laughs> We will, we will make time, right? Um, bringing Azure services 
into the customer's data center. So if a customer cannot use an Azure service in Azure because of latency concerns, uh, they will not have dependencies on the network connectivity, uh, data sovereignty challenge, and so on, they can run the Azure service yeah. in their data center. So that is pretty cool. Indeed. But look, it'd be great if we can speak about sort of the unified control plane in more detail um, and how Azure Arc allows you to manage resources outside of Azure. That would be fantastic if you want to elaborate on that, perhaps. And maybe oh. you could, I believe you may have something to show us on this episode, Thomas. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's why I'm here. No, um, uh, so obviously when when we look at the, the unified control plane, when we see customers doing hybrid and especially also multi-cloud scenarios, one thing they tell us is, hey, we need tools to manage, secure, and govern things in all these different locations, right? And we don't want to have like a management tool for Azure and a management tool for on-prem and the management tool for each of the other cloud providers. Um, that can make things very, very difficult and obviously yeah. uh, complex. So what we did is like we took the control plane we use, like the Azure Resource Manager uh, we have in Azure, and we basically extended it to not just allow the management of Azure resources, but also uh, basically take resources which are outside of the Azure data centers, again, such as servers, Kubernetes clusters, and so on, um, and connect these to the Azure control plane and making actually making them uh, become Azure resources. Uh, and they basically then behave like Azure resources. So they are part, uh, they, they basically are part of a resource group. They're part of a subscription. Uh, we can use tagging, we can use role-based access control. And obviously all the management tools we can use usually for Azure resources, we can now use um, for, for Arc enabled uh, servers and Kubernetes clusters, for example. So um, that is the concept of Azure Arc. Azure Arc is really the bridge between these resources outside of Azure and Azure itself, the control plane. And, and I think as we touched on as we touched on last week, this really simplifies the overall process, right? Operationally. Uh, and indeed from a cost perspective as well, when you're thinking about, you know, if you've got different uh disparate tools out there, different infrastructure silos and so on and so forth, having it all in one place is just really a phenomenal thing for customers to be able to um you know, leverage. Oh, absolutely. And, and you're absolutely right. And I mean, I, mean, I was now spoke, speaking most about the operational and security governance stuff, right? But it comes to the same thing also for developers, right? If you like um, starting to deploy stuff in Azure um, or on Kubernetes clusters on AKS in Azure, um, you can use, you want to use these practices. Um, and, and then when you deploy outside of Azure, um, if you then use need to use different practices, there's a lot of effort going in, right? And and that that makes obviously adds a lot of complexity and cost to the whole operations um, uh, scenario of a customer. Uh, but I think we should just instead of just uh, sitting here and, and talking about it, why don't we just have a look? Why don't you show it? Awesome. Is this one you made earlier? <laughs> <laughs> yep. So here I'm in the Azure portal, right? And the go-to place, basically, when I want to deal with Azure Arc, I go to Azure Arc. And that what then shows the what we call the Azure Arc Center. So here you get all the stuff um, which is Arc related, right? It also allows you to connect different stuff from, from, from your on-premises locations. Uh, or other cloud providers, and then also start to manage these. And if we look at the middle here, you can already see a couple of things I mentioned, right? So if you have, for example, here, add your infrastructure um, to the control plane or deploy Azure services um, to your locations, wherever you want to run them. And then also interesting here on the left side, you can see and we have some management stuff and I will talk about custom locations and the data controller and so on a little bit later. But interesting for us at the moment is this infrastructure part, right? The Arc enabled infrastructure. And you can see here, we can just add a little bit of stuff here um, from speaking from servers, which can be Linux or Windows servers, uh, physical, uh, virtual, running at another cloud provider or in your own data center. And the same thing for different kinds of Kubernetes clusters, SQL servers, and newly also 
Azure Stack HCI, as well as like VMware um, vCenter systems. So we get this VM lifecycle management uh, and so on. But let's dive into, because I think the server part is really interesting for, for many of us here. Um, as you can see here, if I click on this, uh, I get all the, my servers I already have connected. And you can see here some of them show uh, connected, some of them show offline, some of them show expired. And you can see here they show resource group, subscription. So they look like an Azure resource. And then I have tagging here. For example, there's a data center tag. And you can see here uh, I have some of them at my like home data center underneath my desk, if you will. Uh, but then also some other cloud providers, right? And all these systems basically running here and could be connected to the Azure control plane. That's um, a lot of servers to have at home, by the way, Tom. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I, I have a huge infrastructure here. No, no just kidding. It's a very small team environment, but it's, but it's, it's a community. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's have a look at one of these servers. So I have my WAC server here. Um, and if I click on this again, first thing you notice, it looks like an Azure resource, right? If I will not tell you that this is like something which is outside of Azure, um, you will probably think, well, this is actually looks like Azure. And that is exactly what the Arc, what Azure Arc is supposed to do, right? So if you look at the middle of the screen here, you can see it is, again, I, I repeating myself, but it's part of a resource group and a subscription. It has an ID and so on. And it's actually connected to one of our uh, data center locations in this sense western europe and then on the left side you get some additional information about this system so you can see here that this server uh, which operating system that server is running and you can also see uh, um, that it's actually joined to a local domain controller however that mm -hmm. is not necessarily needed right they don't need to be domain joint they can be work group or different domains that it's really um, independent from from having domains the classic windows server domains and then you can see here, I can use tags. So I use some of them to actually do the, do the location of the server, right? But then also, for example, a cost center tag as well. Um, if I look on the left side, you can see here some cool things which come with every Azure resource, basically. Uh, and this is like the activity log. So I can see who did what to that server. So if someone goes out and does some modification, I'll show you what you can do actually in just a bit but that will show up in the activity log. And that is basically based on the um, role-based access control we can see here. So I can now use the Azure AD to create groups for admins, which then can access and manage that server. So what we have today is customers um, going to have a look at um, their, their, their um, on-premises systems. And basically they take away all the administrative rights, maybe except for some breaking glass accounts, but all the administrative tasks are done over Azure Arc. So we have much more control when it comes to compliance and, and so on to actually see uh, who did what on what system. Uh, and you don't have to manage like local user accounts in that sense. Um, in terms of time, I also want to just quickly show a couple of things here. So for example, the security piece, I can then enable Microsoft Defender for cloud. And this will then give me re recommendations for that server, how to secure it. And on the bottom, you can see that luckily it shows nothing here, but I would also get security alerts and so on directly from Microsoft Defender as I can have it for Azure VMs, as well as um, um, servers um, uh, running now outside of Azure, right? I have a couple of other cool things, um, update management, inventory and change tracking, but I want to show you one thing is Azure policy guest configuration. So what I can do is I, or what a compliance administrator can do is assign, for example, Azure policies to different um, resource groups or subscriptions or directly a server if you want to. And then you can do things like, for example, auditing my servers for insecure password settings. So for example, I have one assigned here. Uh, and it goes out and it audits my server to see, hey, we have some recommendations here on what um, secure password settings are. And you can see here I'm not complying with everything. So me now as a server administrator, I can now go out and actually um, have a look at these and fix these issues, right? Uh, the same thing for a compliance administrator, or if you're in charge of security, 
you can go to the policy view in the Azure portal and see like a centralized view of all your systems, of all your servers now um, running in Azure, but also on premises or at other cloud providers, which is super powerful if you're in charge of compliance. And for mm -hmm. Windows Server admins, um, think about this as like group policies on steroids, right? Where you can actually define these policies uh, to your servers, but then also get that centralized view of reporting uh, and so on. So that is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, now, I know, Jason, before the show, we talked a little bit about this and um, you were also very interested in like, how what can we do with the Kubernetes clusters, right? And so mm -hmm. I showed you this about servers and how that works. But what we can also have here is Kubernetes clusters. So you can see I already couple, connected a couple of these. And by the way, um, what we do basically on, on both sides of the aisles, if it's servers or clusters, um, we actually going to we basically to connect these servers, we're deploying an agent on these. And then that server has outgoing traffic to the Azure control plane and manages everything. So you don't need to like open any ports or something like that. Uh, it's all encrypted. You can even have it or using it over a VPN or a express route connection if you wanted to. Uh, that's what we call private link, for example. And so mm -hmm. that is how we actually get these things in here. And there can, you can see here also added a couple of uh, Kubernetes clusters here. So if I look at the Kubernetes cluster, you can see here the same uh, thing as I told you before. Uh, it looks like an Azure resource, right? Even though that Kubernetes cluster runs outside of, of Azure, what you can see here, I can get, for example, the security recommendations. You can see here that I, I did not have, for example, all the extensions installed on that cluster. So that is definitely something I should do to get some more information. Uh, you can do, a, you can see, I can do a couple of things which are um, based on, on this specific cluster. Um, but then I also get, for example, the possibility to do monitoring, such as the data on server, which I didn't show you because I want to show it here in for the Kubernetes cluster. You can see here that I can then actually onboard, for example, a Kubernetes cluster to Azure monitoring, and then I can see specific uh, information here. And so if I go back, I, I also have a cluster. Let me quickly go back here, uh, which is actually onboarded to this, um, I just need to find the right cluster here um, and then go to monitoring. And if I onboarded that server, you will see that I can now see what's going on on that cluster, right? This is now a very specific view for Kubernetes clusters. So you can see here in my nodes, CPU, memory utilization, you can see that there's not much going on. Uh, I get also some additional reports. I can look at my nodes in that Kubernetes cluster. Uh, to get see, hey, is everything okay with my node pools here? Um, so they do, they, they're just fine, right? Uh, I can have a look at my controllers or also my containers here in general. So you can actually go out and deep have a deep look and what is actually running here. So there are, there's some pretty cool stuff uh, we can do here. And again, we have the same for server, just in a server view, uh, what makes sense there. So to be clear, then, what if I don't have a Kubernetes cluster? Is that kind of just a server scenario, or how does that differentiate? So that's actually an excellent question, right? So we have um, customers who already have different kinds of like Kubernetes cluster because they do they want to do some app modernization, they want to use these PaaS services, they want to build um, cloud native apps using containers. But then, as you as you pointed out, there are customers who probably don't have the experience um, uh, or with Kubernetes or they don't have Kubernetes clusters in their environment, or they're thinking about they want to have something which they need less management right, to do. They want to have it more as a service. So what we are yeah. offering today is AKS, like our Azure Kubernetes service running on Azure Stack HCI or even on Windows Server, right? So you get that like this awesome Azure Kubernetes service, which you can run in Azure. So you get like all the management capabilities and, and stuff like that. But instead of running that um, in Azure, you can also run that on-prem and then connect it through Azure Arc to the control plane. So for example, so these server, these Kubernetes clusters here, they could potentially be AKS clusters running on-prem on Azure Stack HCI or Windows Server. And so 
uh, you get this managed like this managed service of a Kubernetes cluster within your data center or edge location, and it allows you to do some cool stuff when it comes to the app deployment or, or monitoring as well. So we offer that like full stack solution, if you will, if, if you need that. Can I also manage my infrastructure like Azure Stack HCM VMware so I can get the full lifecycle management of VMs? Yes, so absolutely great point. Um, as you can see here on the left side, um, I'm not going to dive into this, but you can see here we can also go and manage our Azure Stack HCI clusters or our VMware uh, infrastructure as well, right? Meaning that we can connect these using the Azure Resource Bridge. It's kind of like an appliance you deploy into your environment. And that then connects to your either vCenter or your Azure Stack HCI cluster. And then you can do like VM lifecycle management. You can get monitoring. So you can uh, deploy your VMs. You can remove them. You can like resize them. And all of that directly from the Azure portal or like a CLI you use or API, because everything is managed through Azure Resource Manager. Now, you would probably say, why do I want to do that, right? Because I have already a vCenter or Azure Stack HCI has Windows Admin Center, so I can easily manage that on-prem. But think about a scenario where, uh, where you, for example, have multiples of these cluster or different environments, like a retail store, for example. We have customers mm -hmm. with like hundreds, if, two, if not thousands of different retail store locations, and they now need to manage all these. Now, in the past, that was obviously a pain because they needed to have VPN connections to all these infrastructures, and then they did not have a signalized view. They need to go out and manage these. Now, with Azure Arc, because they show up now, everything shows up in the Azure portal, we can actually go out and manage these from the portal. And we don't need, like, it can do that, like, if I'm now an admin, I can do that from Starbucks, or if I'm working from home, I don't need to be, like, in the office, right, with all these hybrid work efforts going on. I can securely manage all of my infrastructure directly from Azure. And, and I think that is super powerful. The other powerful piece now is, even if you don't have these location requirements, even if you don't have hundreds of locations and clusters and so on, um, one of the big advantages is if you're in this hybrid scenario where you have stuff in Azure and stuff on-prem, you probably use infrastructure as code with biceps, Terraform, uh, ARM templates. Um, you have your DevOps pipelines and so on, and you've run them against your cloud, your Azure environment. Now, on prem, Can I just pause there for a second, Thomas. Sorry, just to, to be clear for the non technical ARM templates and biceps, is there any correlation there? Yes, so arms if, and biceps. No, no, that was yeah. kind of a joke. I'm sorry, mate. Maybe my bad, uh, bad humor, but there we go. I no, no, I, I, I get a, the, the, the reason is because I get a lot of questions around these, right? Um, um, when, <laughs> when we talk about arm and bicep. So, um, yeah, no, um, really, you should, like, I recommend, like, everyone who gets started with infrastructure as code, go with biceps because it makes it way easier to write these things. Uh, arm templates are written in JSON, and again, JSON is not really a, a human friendly format, yeah, I think, in person. Um, it's it's better to have like something which is more human readable, right? And so bicep is a great great thing to do. Um, but so now what? you can use these and run these against the Azure Control Plane, right? You can take these Azure bicep templates, for example, run these against Azure, but then that will deploy stuff in your local data center. Like, how awesome is that? Absolutely. So, um, talking of deploying, then. Are you able to show me how you can deploy a web app on premises, for example? Absolutely. <laughs> I hope the question would come. Um, so let's dive in into, into the, uh, how that actually looks like, right? Um, so I want to quickly show you what you actually need for deploying a web app. That is what we call the Azure Arc enabled services. And if I scroll down here on the left side, you can now see we offer a couple of different Arc enabled services such as data services, which means Azure SQL managed instances or Postgres, uh, or then our application services, which means web apps, functions, event grid, API management, and so on, right? So, um, what do I actually need to run these on prem, right? There must be something I need to do. And absolutely. So, what you need to do is you need to obviously connect a Kubernetes cluster. Again, these can be 
this doesn't need to be AKS on Aztec HCI. It would, it can be, and it's a very good solution for that. But if, even if you run OpenShift or some other Kubernetes distributions, um, you can also connect these, as I, like I showed you before. Now, what you then can do is here on the top is what we call custom locations. So you can create a custom location and you can see here I created two already. One is called other cloud provider zero one and one, the other one is called Tom's data center zero one. Uh, and I basically map these to, as you can see here, some Kubernetes clusters, one again running on-prem, the other one running at another cloud provider. So that is what I prepared, right? So I have now two custom locations and you will say, well, what does that mean? How can I now leverage these custom locations? And it's fairly simple. So if I go and want to deploy a new web app now, as you want, as you asked me to, I just create a new web app. That's the same visit basically as I would have for if I would want to deploy a web app in Azure, right? So I also need to select here a, um, a, a subscription and the resource group, and I could provide a name for that web app, uh, can some do some additional configuration. But then the most important part here now is that when we go to the regions, usually what we see here is just the Azure regions, right? All the Azure regions which are available to you, you have them listed here. But if I scroll to the top, you can now see that also my custom locations show up. Right, so that that is the pretty cool thing now that I can just select. Hey, instead of deploying this to an Azure region, deploy this to my data center, um, and then you can see here there's some changes happening also in the URL of that web app which we assigned by default uh, to it. So we can actually select that um, and change that, and you can now deploy that web app directly on your Kubernetes cluster running on premises at another cloud provider or at your edge location, uh, which I think is super powerful um, to do. And again, going back to the ARM templates and to bicep templates and Terraform, now the only thing you need to do is actually change the region to be um, one of these custom locations instead of an Azure region. And you can actually use the same ARM templates um, uh, to deploy these services. Fantastic. So if I can just recap on this, Thomas, um... For Kubernetes clustering, uh, obviously that can be um, on Azure Stack HCI or on your web server, oh, sorry, your Windows server. Uh, from a web app deployment perspective, they can be deployed both in the public cloud as, as ordinarily people are doing now, but also that could be extended out to on-premises. And with Azure Arc, we can manage our overall infrastructure footprint, both on-premise, obviously, and clearly in the cloud. And that gives us the ability to provide security alerts, insights, being able to leverage those as your services, uh, ensuring compliance, uh, and leveraging your policies. Would that be a, a fair assumption of what we just discussed? Absolutely. You make it. You made it very easy uh, to like to basically <laughs> summarize what I just showed. Um, one thing I would though mention is like one of the benefits now of this whole scenario of running these Azure services on prem, right? or allowing this, this stuff to happen is obviously it's a cool thing to do. But now think about like customers or cloud architects, software developers who need to modernize their applications. They basically need to make some decisions, especially if they're in a hybrid and multi-cloud environment. They would usually, if they go to Azure and they say, well, we <laughs> only use Azure, then they would probably go and use PaaS services, serverless, containers, everything like very modern on, on Azure. Now, if the app, the application now needs to run also on premises and also on other cloud providers, in the past, there were no Azure services, right? Which you could run on premises or at other cloud providers. There was no such, like not, not a solution to do this. Um, so now with this, uh, we allow basically cloud architects and, and software architects to build very modern applications based on Azure Pass. Uh, and run them anywhere without any like restriction on locations. You can basically run it and, and architect it the way you want the app to be architected um, without like need to consideration on, on like, is it running locally or hybrid? Because in the past you would probably fall back to VMs, right? You would say, well, VMs run everywhere. So that is the common ground we have. Uh, now with enabling uh, uh, Azure Pass services with Azure Arc, we can now really leverage, start leveraging that and really build modern solutions. 
Fantastic. Thomas, that was absolutely fantastic. Appreciate it very much. But now we're going to move on to the part of the show called the Server Acronym Review, like we always do. Um, and, you know, I think last time around we had two. I think we may have more this this week. Um, uh, just another long, confusing acronym that doesn't make any sense. But, you know, uh, the producers, as I mentioned, have, have, have found, I think it may be three today. Um, and we're going to put ourselves on the spot. Uh, to see if we can guess what they are. Um, we'd love you guys to pop your thoughts in the comment section below, please, and uh, tell us what you think about these acronyms, whether we're just being ridiculous or we could improve them somewhat. Um, who knows? The comments will prevail. But please, producers, let us know what we have. So on to acronym number one, AVD. Um, I'm going to have a guess at this one. Azure Virtual Desktop. I agree with you, Jason, on that one. And the reason is why this was simple for me is because we just announced AVD on Azure Stack HCI, right? Um, oh, so I wonderful. The, pos the possibility to run Azure, like um, basically virtual desktops, not just in Azure, but also run them on premises um, using Azure Stack HCI. Can you believe I got the first one right and you get it as well? So it's one one. Where where there's there's no benefit to me here. But let, let's let's go on to number two, please, producers. Dart. Now, do I see the point in this one? There is another little joke in there. Um, I <laughs> a terrible one at that, by the way. Um, I, I'm struggling actually. Um, Dart. I to be honest, I know what it is. Um, I've, but you just I, don't want to put me down again, eh? <laughs> I would, <laughs> I would need to check what the acronym means. But I think it's start. I think the D stands for diagnostic, and the T for um, toolkit. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I, I think automatic resolution. No. Ha! Ah! Oh, it's tool set, not toolkit. Okay, but that well, like, at least I got the first one completely right, and I would. Give me, I, I don't know, Jason, but I, I, I deserve a half a point for this, no? I think I'm going to give you a half a point for that, Thomas, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised we have and, actually. Normally, those uh, those are taken out with their acronym. But anyway, let's move on to our third and final acronym of the show. Good Lord. So, uh, shall I try another joke? Let's make no bones about this. <laughs> the radius. Um <laughs> uh I, again do you know what this is going to go down really poorly isn't it in terms of my joke telling abilities but um crikey i've no idea i'll be honest with you radius um i did not even know that it's an acronym i thought it's a full name <laughs> of the solution. a full name for a bone yeah exactly <laughs> or maybe it's something to do with the arm template there you go <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i yeah let's see no, oh. not in a million years. Remote yeah. authentication dial in user service. To be honest, um, it makes perfectly sense. Like it's it's like I, I remember like uh back in my days um when I left like I left one company was my last working day and I switched over to another company and on my last working day what they wanted from me is like hey you're gonna set up a, a radio server like that was like my last working yeah. day. I was like why like why are you making me do this on my last day but uh um but yeah did you um, complete did you complete it in the last day was it a, a a simple job for you or? i i don't think it was that hard i mean at the end the harder part is if you need to then integrate something to that right you want to like for example i think the scenario back then was they wanted to integrate their uh, wireless access points or some firewalls, I can't remember, with Active Directory authentication, right? So they basically needed the radios to be kind of like that endpoint for these uh, wireless access points to connect to. And my job was basically just provide the radio server, um, and that's it. So I think I, I think I mean because I left, I don't know, but um, uh, I think I was successful. So <laughs> I do, I tried sure to believe I was successful. <laughs> I'm sure you were. So listen, Thomas, thank you so much today. Um, I just want to please add, by the way, the cap is looking magnificent. I'm a, a, 
a man who sports a very similar kind of attire uh, when it's a little bit chillier for obvious reasons. Um, but yeah, you're looking very cool today, my friend. Um, thanks again. It's been absolutely insightful. Um, really appreciate your input. Uh, and thanks for you guys for tuning in uh, into this third episode of season three of Rock to the Cloud. Uh, please keep an eye, uh, an eye out right here on IT Top Ops Talk. LinkedIn and YouTube uh, for the next episode. And remember to drop your thoughts in the comments below. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Look forward to the next one. Goodbye. Take care.